Hello students, this is Mr. Ferris. I'm going to walk you through Pre-Cal Lesson 10.2. little caveat, it will be a long lesson because there's a lot of details about inverse functions that we have to go through, so bear with this. And I may ask you to pause every once in a while and work something out. I hope you will do that because you need to process this. You can't just be a passive listener. You need to actually be thinking about what's going on. That will help you greatly in the long run. So a little introductions about inverses, for instance. If I asked you what the inverse of addition is, hopefully you would say subtraction. Those are considered inverse operations, especially when you're solving an equation. If you're trying to solve and you've got an addition in the equation, you would usually do some subtraction to undo that. The inversing of squaring would be square rooting. I'll use a simple for that. The inverse of this function, y equals the log of x, would be x equals 10 to the y. Now this comes from the first semester material that logs and 10 to the are inverses of each other, inverse operations. You don't have to look any farther than your graphing calculator. If you look at the button on your calculator for LOG, the second function of that button will be 10 to the, to the y power. Similarly for ln, the inverse for ln would be e to the power. That's also on the same button on your calculator. Another example of inverses, if the function f at 2 is 17, then the inverse function of 17 would be 2. One way to think about this is 2 is the input in the original equation. 17 is the output. And when we think of inverses, we actually just interchange the roles of the input and the output. So when they ask you for the inverse, you have to consider that 17 is now the output, and you're looking to be, you're looking for the input for that particular output. And so that would be another way to think of inverses, is the roles of input and output are switched around. So then the next question, if negative 2 comma 7 is a point on some original function, then a point that has to be on the inverse would be the point 7 comma negative 2. Again, the roles of x and y, inputs and outputs, are reversed in inverses. And then just another example uh, from the world of geometry, or just even just logical reasoning, when you have a statement like, if a polygon is a rectangle, then it has four right angles, the inverse statement to that would be something like this. If a polygon has four right angles, then it is a rectangle. That statement is considered the inverse statement of the original statement. All you're really doing is exchanging the subject for the predicate. Example one, another example of using inverses to solve an equation. If you're solving the sine of x equals 0 0.8, to sort of undo or do the inverse on both sides, you would want to take the inverse sine of both sides. You would take the inverse sine of the sine of x and the inverse sine of 0 0.8. So algebraically speaking, inverses cancel each other out. They cancel out the effects of each other. And so the answer to this question would be x equals the inverse sine of 0 0.8. So at that point, that would be a question where you would type into your graphing calculator using the inverse sine button, and if you're in degrees, then the answer would be x equals approximately 53.13 degrees. So an, an example of using the inverse sine function to solve an equation. Example two, if you know that g has an inverse, and g at 10 equals negative 26, they're asking for what other values you might know. Well, remember, when you say it kind of in the frontwards version, 10 is considered the input, and 26 is considered, negative 26 is considered the output. And so other values that you would know is that the inverse function of g 
at negative 26 would equal 10. That would be another statement you could write using the information in the original statement. And then similarly, when you have a statement like g inverse of 0 equals 7, well now that means 0 is the output, 7 is the input, and so what we could write from that is, well then, the function g at an input of 7 would equal an output of 0. That's another statement that you know if you're given the inverse statement. So once again, when you look at those next to each other, you see that you're just reversing inputs and outputs, reversing the roles of the inputs and outputs. And then example three, the heart rate in beats per minute of a runner on a treadmill is given by this function. So H is standing for heart rate, but heart rate is a function of speed on a treadmill. So the two variables that we're using here are H and S. So the function notation really can kind of just be an intermediate step. Really, when you just think of this equation, you're talking about a two-variable equation where H equals 60 plus 12S. It's a linear equation. And so if you're evaluating and then explaining, this is going to be really important that you pay attention because the explaining part is where typically students have trouble and they make mistakes. So f at 8, if you go back to the way that this is defined, what we need to think about is, well, what is f? You're actually being able, you're being asked to find f. And let's not forget what f is. f, by definition, is heart rate. You look no farther than the original equation, and that tells you exactly what F is, and it's exactly what you're finding. You're being asked to find a heart rate. The 8 is not the heart rate. The 8 is the input, and the input, according to the equation, is speed, S. So 8 is speed, but you're being asked to find the heart rate because F is the heart rate. So what we're being asked to find is the heart rate when the speed is 8 miles per hour. So all we have to do to actually figure that out is go up to our equation and substitute in 8 into the equation. So our calculation would be 60 plus 12 times 8. That's going to give us the function value, which is heart rate, 60 plus 12 times 8 turns out to be 156 beats per minute. Sometimes it helps greatly to label your answers as soon as you get them because as soon as you label it and you know it's, it's a heart rate, then when you get to the explain in words portion of this, 156 beats per minute is, we can just kind of start writing that as soon as we get the answer, 156 beats per minute is the heart rate of the runner when their speed on a treadmill is 8 miles per hour. That would be the perfect answer. You've got the labels for both numbers, and you know exactly what both numbers are. And that would be a good example of how you would explain in words a number that you calculate. Second part to this, now we're wanting to find the value of s. So we're trying to find the speed for which this is true. So if s is speed, then 180 must be miles per hour. No, I said that wrong. If S is speed, miles per hour, 180 must be beats per minute. So we now want to find what speed would give us a heart rate of 180 miles per hour. So if we're trying to find speed, but we know the beats per minute, we can put 180 in for H and proceed to solve for S. So now we have an equation where we're solving for s. So first step would be maybe subtract 60 from both sides. If you subtract 60 from both sides, you get 120 equals 12s. Then if you divide by 12 on both sides, you get 10 miles per hour. s is 10 miles per hour.
The explaining words part then is, probably all we really need to do is look at the two numbers that we had. So 180 beats per minute, and we had 10 as the speed in miles per hour. So we just need to write a sentence, something like, when the runner's speed, we can say this a couple different ways, but we'll, I'll start with this one. When the runner's speed is 10 miles per hour, their heart rate is 180 beats per minute. Now you could say it equally well by saying when their heart rate is 180 beats per minute, their speed is 10. But it sounds a little more like cause and effect. I mean, the first thing really that happens literally is they, they start running at that speed and then their heart rate goes up to 180. So it makes a little more sense to say it that direction, I think. And then finally, when we get to the third one, notice it's the inverse. So 108 is now... You, have to, you kind of have to look up, I guess, back up here to the um, equation. If you look at the equation, you can see that... Let me get my eraser out here. That's not the eraser. They've moved things around here on I me, mean, and I'm not used to finding the eraser. There it is. So... What I wanted to show you is anytime you're dealing with the inverse, it's probably a good idea to go back to the original equation and realize that in the regular format, H is the function, S is the input. So H is the output, S is the input essentially. So when you reverse the process and use the inverse, now the input is not speed, the input is beats per minute. That's the heart rate. So we're being asked to find the inverse of that. The inverse of that is the speed. So once again, we have to write a little equation. But what I'd like to do is make it really clear at the beginning that what I'm being asked to find is the speed when the heart rate is 108 beats per minute. And to do that, I have to do sim similar to what I just did in step two there. Same thing that I do right here. I'm going to let 108 equals 60 plus 12s because I'm solving for speed. If I subtract 60 from both sides, I get 48 equals 12s. Divide by 12 on both sides, I get speed equals 4. And that would be miles per hour. And then just take a quick logic common sense check. Does it make sense that speed would be 4 miles per hour and heart rate would be 108 beats per minute? Yes. <laughs> it wouldn't make any sense to think of it the other way. So you, you kind of can't get these mixed up if you just think a little bit. Thinking about a runner having a speed of 108 and a heart rate of 4 beats per minute, no, that's not the way it works. So many times you can just do a quick logic check on the numbers and make sure you've got them correct. So making a statement then to interpret this, basically when the runner's speed, kind of the same thing we just did, when the runner's speed is... four miles per hour, their heart rate is 108 beats per minute, and then finally what's the meaning of N versus H? The meaning of F inverse of H. Well, it's nice that they put the H in there because the only other variable that makes sense would be speed. So the meaning of F inverse of H, this is the speed. Probably should have just uh, used the word is there. This is the speed maybe I should say the runner's speed. This is the runner's speed. when their heart rate is 8 beats per minute. And one way we can kind of check that that is true is again go back up to our definition here. 
if you go back up to the definition at the very beginning, you will see that H is function F. It's all right there. If you ever forget what's going on, just go back up to the stem of the problem. H has been defined as F. In other words, the function F is H. We're dealing with the inverse function. So if heart rate is function F, then the other variable is F inverse. And that's what we have. We're finding F inverse, so therefore we're finding a speed. That's what the way we want to write it. We want to write it as a sentence where you say F inverse is the speed when the heart rate is whatever. All right. That takes care of page one. Now flip it over and we'll keep going. Now we turn our attention to page two. The first question is to write the inverse of this equation. If you're writing an inverse of an equation, that means it should be an equation. So instead of P equaling function F at T, we're going to write that T is the inverse function of P. Hopefully if you just say it out loud, it makes sense. If P is a function of T, that's what I'm reading this as, then T should be the inverse function of P. Hopefully that sounds correct and settles in your mind correctly. All right, so stretching that out a little further, if P is this particular function, 20 plus 0.4T, then what's the inverse of P? Well, we just wrote that to find the inverse, you're basically just solving for the other variable. So we know what P is equal to. When you're finding the inverse, you're trying to find what T is equal to. So all you have to do is take this equation and solve it for T. If you're solving for T, we need to subtract 20 on both sides. I hope I can go fast on this because it's just basic algebra. If you subtract 20 from both sides, you'll get P minus 20 equals 0 0.4T. Then if you add 20 on both sides, sorry, if you divide by 0.4 on both sides, it is kind of hard to keep track of what you're solving for if you go too fast. But if you divide by 0.4 on both sides, then you have just solved it for T. So the inverse function is T equals P minus 20 all over 0 0.4. So again, I hope it makes sense that if the original function is P equals, the inverse function should be T equals. That's the nature of inverses. Now, they're not all that easy. So if we had to find the inverse of function B, and B is a function of X, that means we're solving for X. Okay, now this one is not quite as easy. So I think it would be best practice for you right now to see if you can solve that. I would write it like this. I would not write the function notation. I would write it like this to start with. It's just a two-variable equation where you have b on one side and 3x divided by 2x plus 1 on the other side. Pause the video. Really do it. Hopefully you've reserved sufficient time to spend thinking and doing things. So pause the video and spend some time trying to solve for x. And then I will walk you through it after you play it back. So if you spent time working on this like you were supposed to, you know that the problem or the issue or the difficulty is you've got two terms that have x in it on the same side of the problem. And you're solving for x. You're solving for x, but you've got two x's somehow. So in general, your goal should be to, to get x by itself somehow. Isolate x by itself. And that's not easy to do. But one thing you might, you might think of doing is turning this into a proportion because it almost was a proportion to start with. All you have to do is put b over 1 and now it's a proportion. And what you might consider to do then is to cross multiply and set the products equal. We can now use a property from algebra that tells us that the cross products are equal to each other. And that 
may not look like a step in the right direction, but when you think about it, there are no denominators anymore. So we got rid of the fractions. That's a, that's a good thing. That makes it simpler to deal with. But again, we're trying to get x by itself, x on the same side of the problem. So right now, we do not have x's on the same side of the problem. So one of the things we should do is get at least the terms that have x on it in the same side of the problem. But first, we have to distribute the b. So when you take b times 2x, that'll be 2bx plus b. All I'm doing is distributing over addition. And I get that. And now what I can do is I can subtract 2bx from both sides. When you subtract 2bx from both sides, you now have accomplished getting x on the same side of the problem. Now, it's in two different terms, but we can fix that. So when you accomplish getting both terms with x on the same side of the problem, you now have the opportunity to factor the left side, factor an x out of the left side like this. You're going to factor x out of the first term and factor x out of the second term. And when you do that, you'll have x times the quantity 3 minus 2b equal to b. And now we're one step away from solving for x. To solve for x, we just have to divide both sides by 3 minus 2b. Divide by 3 minus 2b. That gives us a final answer of x equals b over 3 minus 2b. That is the inverse function. Again, remember, we started with a b equals function, and we ended with an x equals function. That should show us that we did, in fact, solve for the inverse function. We've got the exact inverse function sitting in front of us now. Success. All right, another example of finding inverses. We'll start out with b equals, we'll just leave the function notation out for right now because we just really want to solve this equation for the other variable. So we're starting with a b equals equation. The inverse will be a t equals equation. Again, I strongly recommend, since all quizzes and tests over this material will be by yourself, and you'll have to figure things out by yourself, pause the video right now and see if you can solve this for t. We did problems like this in the first semester, so we've covered how to do this. Pause the video, spend some time trying to solve this by yourself, and then I'll show you how to do it. Okay, hopefully you paused the video. Again, it takes a lot of discipline to do online learning. You're going to have a lot of this in your future if you're going to go on to college level stuff, so it's good that you practice this now. We're trying to solve for t, so we want to get rid of everything else that we can, one by one, in order. So the most easy thing to do first, kind of the low-hanging fruit, would be to divide by 500 first. That will get rid of that coefficient 500 on the right side. So now we would have b over 500 on the left side and 1.04 to the t on the right side. So hopefully you can see this is one step better. But now the problem is t is not a product, or I should say t is not a factor because you're not taking 1.04 times t. So t is not a factor, t is an exponent. The question is, how do you get t down, f down from up, up there and bring it down to the lower level? And hopefully that rings a bell. How do you bring t down in front? How do you bring t down in front? How do you bring an exponent down in front? The answer is, you do the inverse. What's the inverse of a power? Logarithms. I hope that came into your mind. And it doesn't really matter whether it's LOG or LN. So we'll go with LN just because that's my favorite. So if you take the LN of both sides, what that allows us to do is invoke a property from logarithms that allows us to bring the T down in front. So in the next step, we're going to have the LN of B over 500 equals T times 1.04, sorry, t times the ln of 1.04. Now t is a factor. And since t is a factor and the ln of 1.04 is a factor, then the last step to solve for t 
would be to divide by the ln of 1.04. When you do that, we now have solved for t because these factors cancel and t is equal to, it's a little messy, the ln of b over 500 over the ln of 1.04. That is the inverse function. Again, we started with a b equals function and we ended with a t equals function. So therefore, we are successful and we've got, we've got inverses. And by the way, a little uh, helpful hint here. How would you know <laughs> that these are really correct? How would you know that? Well, here's what you could do. If you wanted to check, and you could always do this, so you'll know. I mean, you, you could know without a doubt that you got it right. Start with the first function, which was b equals 500 times 1.04 to the t. And all you have to do is substitute a number in for t. So, I don't know, what would be a good number, 3 or something? Let's substitute 3 in for t. And when you're finished, then, you will have an ordered pair that you know works for this number. If you do it correctly, you'll find that an input of 3 gives you an output of 562.432. That is an ordered pair that works for the original function. Okay, so if that's an ordered pair that works for the original function, what ordered pair should work for this function? Same two numbers. It's just that 562.432 needs to be substituted in for b. When you put 562.432 in for b and do all of this stuff on the left side, it should equal 3. That would be a way to check all an answers like this for inverse functions, is find an ordered pair that works for one of them and make sure that the reverse ordered pair works for the other one. Then you'll know for sure that you did it correctly. All right, page 3 is just a summary of some things that we did. So now that we looked at all these functions and did, did all this work, we can kind of summarize what's going on here. So if you have some equation like q equals f of t, that's some function where every value of q determines exactly one value of f, here's what we find out. Every function that has this property is going to have an inverse function. Now, if you read that carefully, you, you might think, wait a minute, that sounds familiar, but it's kind of backwards of what we've talked about earlier. Each output, Q, has exactly one input, T. Doesn't that sound a little bit like the definition of a function, except it's backwards? So what we're getting at here is if you've got a function already, a function by definition, again, you have to remember back to first semester, but a function by definition says for every input has exactly one output. That's our definition for a function. So if we know this original statement is a function, this original equation is a function, we already know that every input has exactly one output. But if it additionally has this other property that every output has exactly one input, well, then it will have an inverse that is also a function. That's what this statement is saying. And if that's true, then the inverse, f inverse, will be the name of this function, and the inverse of the output will equal the input always. if and only if the original statement was true. That's basically the symbolic version of the first sentence there. So now we're getting into some uh, wording that we have to kind of check. You're going to have questions that ask you whether or not a function has an inverse, and you'll have to check that. So it's a function to start with if every input has exactly one output, and then it will have an inverse if the opposite is true, that the, every output has an exactly one input.
And if it does have an inverse, we have a fancy name for this. Any function that has an inverse that's also a function is considered invertible, which kind of reminds me of the word reversible. But the fancy word for our sake is called invertible. Now, not every function has an inverse that is a function. Not every function is invertible. Some functions do not have inverses that are also functions. And you can check that really easily. If a function does not have an inverse, if it's not invertible, then you're going to have the same output for two different inputs. Let's do a very simple example. A very simple example of a function that does not have an inverse would be a parabola. So think about a parabola sitting at the origin here. That's a function because every input, every x value, only has one output value. However, look at this output value, whatever this is. Maybe that's, say that's 4 or something like that. This parabola has two outputs at 4, and look where they are. They're coming from negative 2 and positive 2. And so you've got the same output of 4 having two different inputs, 2 and negative 2, and if that happens, then this does not have an inverse that's a function. It's going to violate uh, this test. This is a new test for checking for invertibility. So if you want to check for invertibility, you do a horizontal line test. You put a horizontal line through here, and if a horizontal line intersects a function in two places, then it has no inverse function. So if a horizontal line intersects a function in more than one point, maybe we could say this way, in two plus points, then it is not invertible. In other words, it does not have a function, an inverse function, that is a function itself. So we got this new test to test whether or not a function has an inverse or not. And so it would be real easy on this next graph, show that it is not invertible. All we'd have to do is draw a horizontal line through here. And we see that a horizontal line intersects in two points. Therefore, this function is not vertible, is not invertible. This function does not have an inverse that's a function. All right, so if we graphed this next equation on a graphing calculator, I would do that right now. Just type this into y1, maybe. Say y1 equals, this is some sort of a cubic, cubic equation. If you graph that, accurately on your graphing calculator, it's going to look something like this. It's going to be like a twist that has a positive slope. And when you look at that on a graphing calculator, and you're trying to see if you think it's invertible or not, basically you're, you're probably just going to be thinking of some horizontal line. So if you put a horizontal line there, it only intersects in one point. Only intersects in one point, one point, one point, one point, one point. It just seems like you're never, ever going to have a horizontal line intersecting in two points. So that would be the reason why we could probably safely say um, no horizontal line. I didn't mean to make my uh, pin that thin. I was trying to get a little thinner, but not that thin. Oh, well, no horizontal line appears to hit in more than one place. No horizontal line appears to intersect in two or more points. You can kind of say it like that. Feel free to abbreviate these explanations. And then if we're going to estimate the inverse at 4, remember when you're dealing with inverse functions, 4 is now the output or the, um, I guess we would call it the y value if you think about x and y. So if you're trying to find when the inverse is 4, what we need to solve is this equation. 
we're trying to figure out when does this function hit 4. But if you've got a graphing calculator, then really all we have to do is go up to 4, wherever 4 would be, put a horizontal line through there, and then try to estimate what that x value is right here. This is what we're trying to find. We're trying to find the x value that has an output of 4. So you could kind of trace, you could guess and check, or I would just graph the line y equals 4 and then do the intersect command on your graphing calculator. That's a very handy command to know, is graph a horizontal line at 4 and then find the intersect by the intersect command. So I did it on my graphing calculator, and using my graphing calculator, I found it to be approximately 1.2134. If I go out to four digits, I used my graphing calculator completely to do that one. All right, so here's another equation that we could type in our graphing calculator. If we type this into our graphing calculator, we might be able to, again, show that it's invertible. And when I did that on my graphing calculator, of course, this is an exponential function. And exponential functions kind of have the same look to them. They go like this. They intersect the y-axis at 1. And again, if you just imagine a whole bunch of horizontal lines intersecting that curve, it looks like they never, ever intersect in two points. So that may be kind of what I do is just, if I was going to show that, it's like thinking of a whole bunch of horizontal lines None of them appear to hit the graph in more than one point. So that would be my showing. And then if we had to find a formula for the inverse, again, if you're finding the inverse function, you're solving for the other variable. And probably I would, instead of writing it as p of x equals, I would just call that y equals 2 to the x, since that's the way we probably graphed it. We probably graphed it as y equals 2 to the x. So I would write it like that, and then I would proceed to solve for x. And if you do it like we did the one earlier, we would take the ln of both sides. When you take the ln of both sides, that allows you to bring the x down in front. So now the ln of y equals x times the ln of 2. So solving for x, we divide by the ln of 2 on both sides and get x equals the ln of y over the ln of 2. That would be the equation that represents the formula for the inverse function of x. Now, here's a little note here, and some of you probably have been wondering this, depending on what teacher you had in algebra class. Some of you probably were wondering, well, why aren't we switching the variables? Somewhere you learn that you're supposed to switch the variables with inverses. Well, up till now, it really hasn't made sense there's not been a compelling reason why we'd want to switch the variables. But what if I asked you to graph the inverse on your graphing calculator? If I said type that in your graphing calculator and graph it on the same set of axes that we graphed the original one. Well, our graphing calculators are set up to always be y equals. So you will probably type it into y2 equals in your calculator. Well, when you type it in as a function of x, you're going to have to switch the variables. In other words, you're going to have to write that as ln of x divided by ln of 2 when you type it in. Because the input on a graphing calculator always has to be an x. It's just the way your calculator is set up. So if you have actually solved for the inverse function, you've written it as x equals ln of y over ln of 2, we're just going to have to exchange the variables for the fact that we need to type it into a graphing calculator. So that's when switching the variables makes total sense. We have to have the input be x just so that we can type it into our graphing calculator. And what you find out, it's kind of interesting, when you graph both of these on the same graph at the same time, you get something like this that when you look at it in a certain way, there's symmetry here. Those two inverse graphs are going to be, um, I know my diagram's not real accurate, but if you put the diagonal line of y equals x, if you imagine the diagonal line y equals x, those two graphs, the original and its inverse, will be symmetric with respect to the line y equals x. That's always true. So there's a visual way to tell if two graphs are inverses. They have to be like reflections across the line y equals x.
that would be like a visual check for that. So we kind of did see, we graphed the graphs at the same axis. And then uh, another little feature of domain and range, let's just answer that by filling in the blanks down here. A feature of domain and range with inverse functions is this. The domain of the inverse, if you think about what inverses are and you switch things around, the domain of the inverse is always the range of the original function. And the range of the inverse is always equal to the domain of the original function, which should make total sense because if x's and y's exchange roles, well, so will domains and ranges. They will, they will switch roles. All right, so now maybe the deepest thing. Uh, <laughs> this is where it gets a little complicated. Uh, we know, let me go back to the, uh, the parabola. We know that parabolas are not invertible. We checked that already. It fails the horizontal line test. So this function, let's just say it's y equals x squared. This function does not have an inverse. That's also a function. And it turns out, if I were to graph what I think the inverse is, if I were to graph the inverse, the graph of the inverse would look like this. And this is not a function because you have two outputs for a lot of inputs. So a parabola that's sitting upward on, a, on an axis system does not have an inverse that's a function. Because, you might remember, there's a little test you can do. If it fails the horizontal line test, then it does not have an inverse that's a function. However, you can actually make you, you can make it work somehow. So let's go back to the, the parabola. So this parabola does not have an inverse that's a function because it fails the vertical line test. However, what if we just took an eraser and we erased part of it and we just kept this part? How about we just take half of a parabola? Wouldn't half of a parabola be invertible? Because if you think about the horizontal line test, everywhere you put a horizontal line, it only crosses in one point. So there's kind of a tricky, sneaky, clever way to get around certain functions that are not invertible. You simply restrict the domain. You just restrict the domain. In other words, you just say the domain is all reals greater than or equal to zero. If you do that, now it's invertible. That's how we work around that. We can work around this problem where some functions are not invertible by simply restricting the domain, which is kind of like erasing half of it, erasing part of it. And when you erase part of it, then what's left is a function that has, a, has an inverse. It is invertible. And that explains something. That explains why if you solve this function right here, if the sine, well, this is a true statement. The sine of 150 degrees is 0.5. So you would think that when you do the inverse of 0.5, you should get 150 if this is invertible. If sine is an invertible function, then this should work. But type that in your graphing calculator using degrees. If you're in the degree mode, and you do inverse sine of 0.5, you'll find out you don't get 150, you get 30. And this is why. It's when your calculator is designed to do inverse cosine, they had to restrict the domain. Otherwise, you would not be able to, to calculate inverses. In fact, if you graph y equals the sine of x, you might remember you get a wave, an infinite wave. Well, infinite waves do not pass the horizontal line test. So sine waves do not have inverses. However, if we would restrict the domain to just maybe part of a wave, like from here to here, then it would be invertible. So that's what your graphing calculator does. Your graphing calculator has restricted the domain of sine so that you can actually get a, an inverse. And to prove my point, if you would graph 
this inverse sine function, you will find that the inverse sine function looks something like this. The boundaries on the x-axis are 1 to negative 1, and the boundaries on the y-axis are pi over 2 to negative pi over 2. That is the graph of the inverse sine function. That's why when you do inverse sine, you only get numbers between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2, negative 90 and positive 90. You don't get answers like 150. So that's a little deeper stuff, and I know that goes by pretty fast and probably is not the most important part of this. The most important part of this lesson was the stuff on uh, the first three and a half pages. I know that was long and it was kind of deep, but that's the nature of pre-cal. It doesn't really get easier, it just gets different. So hopefully you will practice your homework and finish the rest of the assignment that's given to you, and I will see you in class.